Hello, hi, welcome. <laughs> it's very nice to be here at the Buddha Society because I almost started out here. I told this story last time. Did you remember that? Yeah, last time? I'll just tell you why we waited for the cameras to set up. And I, when I started out, I didn't really know what to do. Yeah, I was kind of one of these uh, atheists and had no idea about Buddhism. And I read a few books kind of randomly here and there, and I was in Japan, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then one day I decided I wanted to go to a monastery, check out a monastery in the UK. Uh, and I had no idea what to do. Uh, so I got out the uh, white pages, uh, B, U, uh, D, yeah, <laughs> Buddhist. I came to Buddhist society, found the front of a cold yard, and said, where's the new monastery here? And of course, he said, I'm not about the So that's how I ended up in those monasteries. So that's how I started. <laughs> so this is thanks to the Buddhist society that I'm actually here now, and this has all been happening here. So that was stage number one of my career as a monk. And then I, later on, I heard about Ajahn Brahm. Has everyone heard about Ajahn Brahm? Yeah? Anyone not heard about Ajahn Brahm? That's a you the better question. OK. So I, then I heard a talk from Ajahn Brahm. And so I did a similar kind of thing. I heard his talk about, wow, OK, this is my teacher. And so I called up his monastery in Australia. And I said, can I, can I come to Australia now? And he said, sure. And that's how I ended up in Australia. <laughs> So uh, sometimes you just have to kind of just do things, right? And kind of not be too, too afraid. And kind of it works out marvelously sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. So, so uh, yeah. are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, uh, talk about the uh, uh, the problems of the world. Uh, yeah. In Buddhism, we are experts in talking about dukkha uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, I think right now is, uh, is kind of one of those times in, uh, I don't know about what you think, uh, but a lot of people seem to be a bit depressed and sad about how the world, where the world is going. Uh, you know, problems like climate change, obviously we have been through the pandemic recently. Uh, we have all this uh, political turmoil going on in, in the world. We have wars happening uh, just in our backyard. Uh, I just came from Poland, yeah? Uh, and there was all these Ukrainian cars everywhere. Obviously the Ukrainians flocking across the border. Uh, and trying to find some kind of refuge. And so you get this, you know, you have this feeling that the things in the, the world is a bit unstable. Yeah? There's kind of more autocracies kind of in the world again. There's kind of less uh, uh, freedoms or whatever. And that's kind of the world seems to be going in a funny place. And at times such as this, uh, and I think one of the kind of really important things as a Buddhist monastic or as a Buddhist, uh, is to give teachings that are relevant to the times, uh, yeah? to actually see how can we apply these wonderful Buddhist teachings uh, to the contemporary problems that we have. Uh, it's important not to be too, um, uh, too kind of theoretical uh, about Buddhism, uh, but make it really, really practical. Uh, and because this is something that is so much on people's minds, uh, people getting a bit depressed, a bit sad about uh, what they consider or perceive, rightly or wrongly. And sometimes it's very hard to know whether the world is going bad or whether it's really difficult to know, but that seems to be the perception by many people. Uh, so what do we do with this? Uh, how do we think about this in a way to kind of use this as an opportunity uh, for spiritual practice? Uh, and this is really the bottom line. Yeah? Whatever happens in our life, uh, if we use it wisely, yeah, it will be grist for the mill. Yeah, grist for the mill of spiritual practice. Yeah. And so this is uh, what the talk is going to be about today. Yeah. And uh, one of the ways of dealing with the problems of the world uh, is to become a bit of an activist. Uh, yeah, and to kind of get, get out there and to write blogs about climate change and kind of start climate change institutes and, and to do all of these kind of things. And many people are doing that. And some Buddhist monastics are doing this. And you will know probably who I'm talking about, some of these monastics. And uh, so they, you, you do things in that sense. And of course, uh, that is a good thing to do. If there is a problem in the world and we can apply Buddhist morality and Buddhist ethics uh, to help alleviate some of the problems in the world, then of course we're doing a good thing. And we should be doing that. Uh, yeah? This is part of the idea of Buddhist morality, is to help other people out, uh, right? Uh, making good karma for ourselves uh, and also helping other people at the same time. Uh, to me, this is one of the hallmarks of spiritual practice, right? If, you, if you're going to decide whether an action or something you say or even a thought that you have uh, is spiritual or not, is Buddhist or not, uh, the simple question to ask, is it good for both myself uh, and for the other person? Uh, if something is good both for yourself and for the other person, uh, it is a spiritual quality or a spiritual action. Uh, if it is good just for yourself, it's selfish. Uh, 
if it's good just for the other, then it is a it is kind of a self denial or whatever you want it to be. It should be good for both. And of course, if we do things for society at large, if we do things that you know, help people, helping ourselves in this way, of course we're doing something good. Huh? So certainly that is right. Huh? But uh, uh, there is also a downside with that, especially as a monastic, and how far you should take these kind of things. Huh? And if you become com com completely obsessed with, for example, climate change or any one particular issue, huh? the problem with that is that actually there may not be a solution. Huh? And right, we see that now in the world, is there a solution to climate change or is there not? And we just don't know. Are the politicians capable of kind of getting the act together or are they not? And I'm not really blaming the politician, it's just cause and conditions happening and there are pressures on them that maybe probably I have no idea about, so fair enough. But the point is there may not be a solution. So is it right to spend your entire monastic life or even your lay life for that matter pursuing this problem and trying to resolve it. Is that really a good idea? And this is kind of the thing with life. Yeah? There's always one problem after the other. None of these problems may have a solution, right? So we go, maybe even if you help solve one problem, there's always another one waiting behind it. Another one after that. Another one after that. And this human realm of ours, there is no end to problems. There's always more down the track, yet somewhere in the future lying down there. So there must be an alternative way of dealing with the world, an alternative way of thinking about it uh, that enables us to kind of go beyond the problem, not just solving endless problems, uh, but actually transcending the problems, uh, going beyond them, uh, going to something more profound, something more deeper. And uh, one, of my, kind of the, one of my favorite little stories, uh, there's a little book that we wrote quite recently called Coronavirus. Uh, I mean, have you heard the book Coronavirus? Yeah? Okay. So this is coronavirus, or Karuna is compassion, right? So instead of coronavirus, coronavirus, spreading the idea of compassion in the world. And uh, that story, someone asked me if we, if we could put some stories together about Ajahn Brahm, because uh, it was his 71st birthday or 17th birthday or something, I can't remember what it was, something like that. And someone wanted to kind of produce a book, yeah, and for Ajahn Brahm in his name or whatever. And so, uh, and one of the stories that we wrote in that connection, I, I was tasked with kind of giving the kind of bare bones for, to those stories uh, because uh, I probably know Ajahn Brahm more than most people in this world. I've been living with him for almost 30 years. Uh, it's a long time. Is that, is that a long time? Was it not a long time? I'm not sure. <laughs> depends how you think about it. Uh, depends whether you take the samsaric perspective or the kind of more kind of one life perspective. Yeah? Is the dependent origination is that about one life or is it about many lives? So if it's about many lives, then it's a very short period of time. Yeah? Anyway, so uh, one of these stories, uh, and these are my personal experience with Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and it's very interesting when you live with someone like Ajahn Brahm, yeah? you see him in daily life, you see things that nobody else gets to see. Yeah? And you can ask him questions, and he will say things to you uh, yeah, that no one else has heard before. And sometimes the things that comes out of a mouth of someone like Ajahn Brahm is very unpredictable and very uncertain, and often very, very interesting. Yeah. And he may not perceive it himself as interesting, because for him it's kind of just second nature, right? Uh, but when you hear it, like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? That's really interesting, Ajahn. Why don't you teach this? Oh, is that interesting? Okay, I'll teach it to future. <laughs> Something like that, uh, yeah. And so this was, uh, uh, this was the stupendous story of the great fire that came through Bodhinana Monastery in 1991. January, this was the hottest day on record at that time in Perth. It was 46 point something degrees. Yeah. What is the hottest we had in the UK so far now? You had maybe, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, not 46 yet, right? Okay, maybe yeah, we'll sure. climb for You had 40, really? That's, that's bad news, isn't it? Yeah. That's, really, that's really bad news. Okay, even in the UK, 40. It's supposed to be raining here. It's supposed to be kind of cool, yeah? Okay, that's scary because 46 doesn't sound so bad anymore than that. So maybe, maybe you think it's. But anyway, the, the problem in Perth is that not just that it's 46 degrees, but it has been dry, it hasn't been raining. By the end of January, January there's been no rain for two months already. So everything is tinder dry. And so, uh, at, on this hottest day, yeah, there was a fire that started not so far from the monastery. Yeah. And it was a really, really big fire, one of these crown fires. Uh, and these crown fires, they, when it's so hot and it burns in Australia, because these are gum trees, eucalyptus trees, uh, they have a lot of oil. Yeah? They're very, very oily trees. Uh, and because of the oil and the heat, uh, 
these trees like they explode, yeah, they kind of go up in flames like an explosion. Yeah. And the is quite spectacular and quite scary as well. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why they like these fires, because they want to see those trees exploding. I don't know, you know, all this uh, pyromaniacs, and this is what happens. Uh. And uh, so because most of these fires are actually lit by people, this is kind of the extraordinary thing. Yeah. And so this fire was coming to the monastery, right? And the fire brigade was coming into the monastery, and they were saying to Ajahn Brahm, the fire is coming, yeah, yeah, everyone was kind of huddled together in the main hall of the monastery. The fire brigade said, you have to evacuate her. Yeah, this fire is coming, this is 46 degrees, uh, this is super duper hot, yeah, it's coming in your direction. Uh, if you don't evacuate, uh, everyone may die. Yeah. So we have to let the buildings go. Buildings are not as important as human life. Uh. Is that true? That's what they say, right? But uh, some, I wonder, it, human life, how we, sometimes we overrate human life, I think. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get back to that later. On. You know, this is controversial, right? You have to say a few controversial things to make it interesting. So, okay. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's kind of the standard. Everyone thinks that's so kind of that you go with the flow. So, okay, so it's, uh, it's you know, you have to evacuate. Uh, and they said to Ajahn Brahm, well, the fire is coming. Ajahn Brahm knew as well because he had studied fires. Uh, and he knew we had laid, laid out the monastery in such a way as to, we had fire uh, hydrants in various places and fire pumps and all of these kind of things. And he, so he knew how fires work. And uh, at that point, uh, Ajahn Brahm told me, uh, I knew uh, the monastery was gone. Yeah, the fire was coming. The fire brigade was saying, you, you're going to have to evacuate. Uh, uh, this fire is very severe, 46 degrees or whatever. Uh, this is the end of things. Uh, so he knew at that point. Uh, it was going to go. And uh, this was in uh, January 1991. They moved onto this property in November 1983. Yeah. Yeah, so that was about how many is that? That's seven years and two months or something like that. Uh, and in that period, uh, Ajahn Brahm had basically worked non stop doing only one thing building up the monastery. That's all he'd been doing yeah, for those seven years. Uh, and when Ajahn Brahm puts his mind to something, he really works incredibly hard. Uh, it's like 7 in the morning till 7 at night. Uh, and if he isn't finished with something, he gets the floodlight out, right, in the evening, and then continues working in, into the evening. Yeah. And still he has good meditation. Yeah. I, don't ask me how he does it. That's how much good does it. Yeah. This is Ajahn Brahm. It's like superhuman. I should, I should ask that question, how do you become superhuman? Like, yeah. Let's we'll see if we can do that. Yeah. Really, an extraordinary dedication. Seven days a week, yeah, week in, week out. Uh, and uh, so this was his life's work. Yeah? This was the main thing that he had done in his, in his monastic life, building up this monastery. Yeah? And now he knew his life's work was going to be destroyed. It was going to be left with nothing. It's going to be all in ruin. Just a pile of ashes left behind. Uh. And so I asked Ajahn Ram, uh, how did you feel that? Uh? And he told me, at that moment, uh, when I knew everything was going to go, uh, I just let go straight away. Uh. Yeah? I didn't feel anything. I just let go. Uh. And at that moment, uh, I kind of knew uh, that if I uh, was going to come back the next day, I would start from scratch again the next day. Uh. And I thought, what? what? <laughs> How is that possible? For most people, if your life's work is ruined, uh, even if just your house burns down, it's really traumatic, right? It's really, really hard. And there's no way you're going to come back the next day and just start from scratch again, uh, right? Uh, be working on this for seven years. Uh. And so I asked him, uh, how is that possible? How can you let go so fast and kind of decide straight away you're going to come back the next day and start from scratch? How, can, how is that possible? And he said to me, it is possible because when I built this monastery, I didn't build it for the result of having a monastery. I built it because it is a good thing to do. When you build a monastery, it's an act of kindness. It is an act of generosity. It is an act of basically building Dhamma qualities within yourself and for the community around you. And that continuation of building things, building Dhamma qualities, that can always just continue the following day. The, the buildings were for him were kind of, um, they were kind of irrelevant almost, right? That was kind of a second thing. The fact was that he had been practicing the Dhamma all the way through, and that was the important thing. And it's such a powerful story, such a beautiful story, because it shows you what really matters in life. If we look for results, if we look for outcomes, we're almost always going to be disappointed, because we don't know whether these outcomes are going to happen or not. Yeah, they may happen, they may partially happen, they may not happen at all. It is not in our power 
you know, to ensure that these things will actually happen according to our plan. Yeah. And because outcomes uh, are so uncertain, uh, what we have to do instead is to focus on the process, how we actually get to these things. Uh, and if the process is right, uh, if we do things in accordance with the Dhamma, uh, then we're always going to be okay. Uh, yeah? That is where we are really building up the future. Uh, because the future are the qualities of your heart. Uh, the future are the reduction in uh, defilements, the building up of good qualities like metta, compassion, peace, uh, kindness, uh, and these kind of things. Uh. So uh, this is kind of what I hear these kind of things. That is the sort of things that really impresses me. Yeah. I find that really supremely impressing, yeah. impressive, yeah. because it is something that I would never be able to do. Yeah. I'm trying to lean that direction, but I find it really hard to imagine even you know, doing that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we, I think we focus on the wrong things of the Buddhist path, uh, what actually is really impressive. Uh, yeah, we focus on, okay, you read the suttas, you read about kind of monks flying through the air, and I think, okay, a bit of entertainment, no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> that's all it is, right? Entertainment. It's not anything, wow, that's really cool, but then afterwards you kind of forget about it, it doesn't really do much for you. Huh? Right? That's a kind of <laughs> I don't know if you would like to see someone fly, but, uh, uh, but to me this is what the real Dhamma is about. Uh, this is the real spiritual qualities, and to me this is deeply impressive in a way that some of these other displays are not. Uh, and so this is a, kind of gives us a pointer here about how to deal with the problems of the world, because fires is just one other of these kind of great disasters we have to deal with, and especially in Australia, not so much here in the UK. Maybe, maybe I don't know what's happening in the UK, but I, I assume that anyway. Yeah. But in Australia, it can get very, very bad. I mean, you heard about the really big fires we had a couple of years ago, yeah. and uh, we're they said billions of animals uh, got killed in those fires. Uh, billions, right? Uh, it's really, really bad. Not millions, billions. Uh. So, anyway, so um, let us talk a little bit about, uh, go from there, go from forest fires to some of the kind of big uh, issues in the world right now. And of course, one of the really big issues right now is the war in Ukraine uh, and what is happening there. And it's, uh, very interesting coming from Poland. I was in the south of Poland, not so far from the Ukrainian border in, in Krakow. Uh, Krakow, Krakow, they say in Polish, Krakow, Krakow. Okay, anyone <laughs> Polish here? <laughs> uh, Polish is very dodgy, yeah. But, um, so, uh, and it's not so far away, so it's kind of which, which is interesting. And uh, as I said, I saw all these cars with Ukrainian uh, uh, license plates and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, so this is really kind of, right now, obviously, very interesting. And, you know, one of the things about this war in Ukraine, no one had really predicted it. Yeah? Everyone was kind of surprised. Uh, maybe not everyone, but kind of the vast majority anyway seemed to be surprised by this. Uh, and uh, so one of the interesting things then is to see the actual reaction of people uh, when these things happen there. Uh, and the most interesting reactions are often the reactions of those people on the ground, yeah, in Ukraine. What do they feel about this? And what I find often interesting yeah, is that people who are further away from the real action, yeah, maybe here in the UK, maybe Australia is too far away. So Australia, kind of, we don't, we barely know there is a war in Ukraine. Actually, no, we do know there is a war in Ukraine. But, we are very, but people who are a little bit further away seem often to be more concerned than the people on the ground in Ukraine. And anyway, I, I, so I, I read some of these, um, a couple of newspaper interviews, yeah, with uh, some of these people who had been affected by the war. Uh, and there was kind of two very different uh, uh, responses uh, that people had to the war. And of course, one of the responses of what you would expect, uh, people were despairing, they were saying, oh, everything is being destroyed, my livelihood is gone, my job doesn't exist anymore, yeah, my, if you're a student, my college has been destroyed and burned down, my family members have died, uh, that's the... This is obviously some of the really hard things to deal with. My house is just in ruins uh, and these kind of things. So some people were very angry and very upset uh, and had really kind of were very, uh, uh, obviously not very happy with the Russians. Uh. But then there was uh, another, other people, yeah? And these were people who almost did not dare to raise their voices because they thought it would be too insensitive to say this. Uh. But they said uh, that when the war broke out in Ukraine, uh, they felt more happy uh, than before the war, right? And this is so interesting, because it turns upside down how we normally think about these issues. And what they said was that, well, when the war broke out, suddenly we kind of started working together, started cooperating again. 
-hmm. We started to have compassion for each other. Yeah. yeah. We started to kind of be able to, uh, we, you know, we could speak to each other in, in kind and friendly ways instead of kind of the kind of usual thing when you get too close to each other, too used to each other, you take each, each other for granted and you don't really uh, treat each other as well as we should. Yeah. yeah. And so they said, actually, life is much better with the war, right? <laughs> That is kind of extraordinarily interesting here. Yeah. And it shows that there's something very profound going on here that we often miss uh, when we look at these things. Uh. And there's another story which I often like to tell as well in this particular context. And I apologize if you have heard it before, but uh, uh, I've certainly heard it before. Yeah. But this story is a story about a, this was a, a man, it's a Norwegian book, yeah, written in Norwegian language, uh, which my a girlfriend I had had. 30, 40 years ago, something like that, a long time ago. But then, anyway, she, this is what a good girlfriend does. She gives a nice book to read. Eh? So she gave me this book. Eh? And this book was called something like, um, what was the title again? The, uh, uh, Mankind and Happiness, or something to that, that effect. And this was written in 1946, very soon after the Second World War, eh? right? Eh? And uh, part of what he wanted to write about was this idea of the paradox of happiness, as he called it. Eh? Yeah? Because he said, and he said something that was very similar to this, wo this woman in Ukraine had been saying. He said that during the Second World War in Norway, yeah, many people were far more happy, had far more sense of meaning in their life than they had before the war. Yeah. Before the war, okay, you kind of, you know, you're kind of doing your ordinary business or whatever, okay, you had many problems before the war because you had the Great Depression and those kind of things, but things were kind of starting to get better again in the late 1930s. Yeah. Uh, but then the war came, and suddenly, pe he said, many people were more happy. Huh? Now, you could argue that Norway was very bad, hit, badly hit by the Second World War, which is true. Huh? Yeah? But still, people were sent to concentration camps. Uh, still, there were people getting killed in Norway. Huh? Still, there was a lot of rationing going on. Huh? Did you had rationing here in the UK as well, presumably in the Second World War? Yeah. So food was rationed, clothes were rationed, spare parts, all of these things, because world trade was seizing up, it was very hard to get things. Uh, and so it was materialistically, or materially, uh, it was actually a very, very difficult time for most people. Uh, but he said again, uh, it was this thing that suddenly people were coming together. Uh, they had a common purpose, uh, they had a sense of meaning. Uh, they were kind of looking after each other, looking out for each, uh, each other. Uh, and even the Germans, yeah, they weren't even so angry with the Germans either. They probably understood that there are higher powers that control all of these things. Yeah? The Germans were kind of just young soldiers going into the war, not really knowing what they're doing here. Yeah? Like the Russians now, yeah, if you see all these kind of young Russian men being sent in as cannon fodder, yeah, just to be kind of blown up. But how can you be angry with them? It doesn't make any sense. You have to have compassion for them. Yeah? They kind of what is happening over there. Yeah? And the same thing was happening in Norway. And he said, this is the paradox of happiness. So. Everything should be bad uh, on the surface, uh, but underneath, actually, things are not as bad as they, as they, as they seem. Uh. And this is very interesting for, I think, a number of reasons. Uh. And the first reason, I think, the most, maybe the first lesson to learn from this, uh, is that when you see all the pictures, when you see all the suffering, uh, remember there's two sides to this. Uh. It is not necessarily as much suffering as you think, uh, for everyone at least. Yes, there is a lot of suffering in the war, but there's also an alternative side where other people find meaning and they find purpose. Uh. And so this kind of changes our attitude a little bit. Uh. When you see people getting blown up in Syria or in Afghanistan or now in Ukraine or wherever there are wars, uh, there are many other things going on beyond, below the radar. Uh. Below the radar there are people who are going to be kind, uh, compassionate, looking out for each other, being generous, taking people into their homes. Uh. One of the beautiful things that I found out when I was in Poland, uh, yeah, how generous the Polish people are to the Ukrainians, uh, taking them into their private homes, uh, putting them up in their spare room, if they haven't got the spare room, in the living room, right, wherever it might be. Uh, and actually, the, but sometimes the best qualities of people really come out with the best qualities when these kind of things happen. Uh, and when you see that, you gain a bit of faith in humanity again. Uh, but when everything is going too well, uh, Everything is, everyone is really happy, the economy is growing, and that's when we get grumpy and bad with each other, right? Uh, <laughs> it's not true. Yes. Yeah, we, get, we become complacent because things are going too well. Uh, complacency takes over, uh, and everything goes really badly as a consequence. Uh, and so, under the radar, there are often all of these beautiful human qualities coming out, yeah, expressing themselves in the world. Uh, 
And this kind of amazing, it sometimes it takes these disasters, it takes this kind of suffering uh, for these qualities to come out. Uh. So next time you look at the picture from a war, uh, when you see the rubble, you see the buildings falling down, uh, look below the radar. Uh, yeah? I'm not sure if there's going to be a radar in the picture, but look below, you know, look kind of below the surface uh, and see some of those, or feel some of those human qualities that are there. Uh. And that kind of uh, opens up something uh, which is very different from how we normally think about these things. Uh, and it kind of gives a sense of hope. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't, things don't seem so depressing anymore. Uh, people seem more hopeful when these things happen. Uh. So um, uh, this is the first thing that I want to say, because it changes our attitude a little bit to what we see here. Uh. Actually, there may not be such an incredible reason for being depressed about these things. Uh. The other thing that I think also is very important here, yeah, I'm just carrying on with this particular topic, uh, is that from a Buddhist point of view, uh, death is not necessarily such a terrible disaster, uh, right? Uh, I think this idea that death is such a terrible disaster is something that we have inherited from the Christian outlook, uh, yeah, even though that we kind of live in the post-Christian society. Do you consider the UK post-Christian society, or is it the Christian society, or mixed society, or... Uh, <laughs> secular society, right? Yeah, okay, secular society. Uh, we, we live in these secular societies, but still, Christian values obviously are very influential in this society because it has been so influential for hundreds of years. When did Christianity first come to the UK? I don't know, year 600, 700, maybe something like that, maybe even earlier. Yeah. 460 something. Really? That's when it started out. Okay, so that's okay. So the, Right, and that was, uh, okay, good, thank you. <laughs> in Norway, it only came after year 1000, yeah, so much, much later. Yeah. So that's a big gap. Uh, the distance between Norway and the UK isn't that great. I wonder why they could just ship it across the North Sea, yeah, but uh, obviously having problems there. Uh, they weren't as good with the missionary work yet in those days. Uh, the Romans, yeah. The, uh, right, uh, yeah, the Romans were still here at that time. Well, yes. 416, uh, before the Anglo Saxons. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Before, the Roman, before the legions retreated back to Rome. Right, yeah. <coughs> so it came during that period. During that period, right, okay, yeah. They did the many bad things, didn't they? <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm being very naughty now. But, uh, <laughs> so, but what kind of religion did they have before the Romans? Uh, for that kind of was the, like the Nordic, uh, more like a Nordic uh, religion? Celtic religion. Celtic religion. Yeah. Would have been various kind of gods and these yes. kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I reckon that's a pretty good religion, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's so different from the Norse gods and yeah. so on. The problem was a relationship between yeah. the two, actually, yeah. because there would have been cultural exchange yeah. and all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much in favour of these kind of religions, so, so I am. Yeah. Anyway, let's not talk about that now because that's kind of, that's a different topic. Yeah, but uh, you can ask about it later if you wish. Uh, so where 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 we now? <laughs> So death, right? Death, the idea of death uh, is something that I think very much comes from Christian ideas. You have been given life by God. Uh, it's like a gift given by God. And of course, if it is a gift by God, it is very valuable. That's why abortion has traditionally been very problematic within the Christian church and why Catholicism has a lot of problems with this. Uh, life is sacred because it has been given by God. Uh, but what if God hasn't, hasn't given you life? Is it still sacred? Uh, Maybe it's not sacred anymore. Eh? <laughs> and if life isn't sacred, uh, that may change our whole idea of whether death is as bad as we think it is. Eh? And of course, from a Buddhist point of view, it is not death that really is the problem. Eh? Death is a very useful contemplation because we can use it to become better human beings. We can use it to en enhance our spiritual path. Eh? But death is not really the issue. Death is more like a transition, right? Okay, so you live, uh, you transition to something else, and you carry on somewhere else. Uh, it's just like in this life now. We always we transition, yeah, transition from UK to Australia, and now back to the UK again, uh, yeah. And some of you had probably come from overseas as well, right? Uh, and uh, so we kind of move around in the world. So death and rebirth are a little bit more transition than normal, right? But basically the same idea as usual. So. Big deal or not big deal? Yes. <laughs> so, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, it's not death that is the real issue. It is how we live it that is the real issue. And so the question we should ask when we see all of these people dying in Ukraine or wherever, how have they lived their lives? 
And if they have lived well, if they are good people, we say, good on you. This is an Australian expression, it means well done, right? Good on you. <laughs> We're living well then. And so, uh, and that is the right attitude. So maybe all this death that we see in the world, maybe it is not so, so bad. Eh? And this is a beautiful attitude to have to dying. Eh? So if you, for example, I would recommend you if you have a family member who dies, eh? and if you look at the death of your family member from that point of view, yeah, actually, eh? my dad, my mom, eh? they were really good people. Eh? So why am I so concerned if they're dying? Eh? Yeah? Well done, Dad. Well done, Mom. Okay, now go and have a, have a good time wherever you get reborn afterwards. So. <laughs> yeah. And maybe they're kind of waving out to you and say, carry on, son or daughter. Yeah, live well. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. Yeah, we'll see you later on. Then. Why are we so concerned? Eh? <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's weird, yeah, whether death is good or bad. A small change in perception eh, can actually make a big difference eh, in how we actually relate to this phenomenon. Eh? So, um, that's the second kind of idea, yeah? When we look at these wars in Ukraine, we grieve over all the dying, etc. But again, it is an alternative way of looking at this. Uh, there is a kind of, what I would consider, a more Buddhist kind of outlook, uh, and less kind of Christian or outlook which, is, uh, uh, which has been formed by the society that we live in, uh, you know, the Western society or British society or Australian society, whatever it might be. Yeah? So this is the, uh, the first point, yeah? This is the first issue, uh, first thing I want to kind of cover here. Yeah? This is the, we look at these things in this way, yeah? and it changes some of the problem. Yeah? And uh, you could argue, I would argue, maybe just very briefly about climate change as well. Climate change is a similar kind of thing, in my opinion, yeah? yeah? People are very concerned about it, and rightly so. Yeah? So we should do what we can to, you know, help overcome it and uh, alleviate the problems and whatever. Yeah? But uh, again, it is like a transition uh, that we have to go through. Uh, yeah? And when that transition happens in one way, either very severely or not so severely, or whatever happens, uh, we will come out to the other side. Uh, we will carry on. Uh. Yeah, it's like death, really, in a sense. It is a transition that is very large. Uh, there will be suffering during the transition because it's hard to do. Uh, but once we come out the other side, uh, yeah, even if we go back to the Stone Age, uh, I don't know if we go back. What, does anyone think we're going to go back to the Stone Age? Uh, some people say it's going to be the Stone Age. I'm not, I'm not convinced about that, but anyway. So, but even then, Stone Age people, they can practice Buddhism, right? Yeah, you can still meditate even if you live in the Stone Age. You don't need any tools. You know, maybe it's better to practice Buddhism because no iPhone, right? No, and this kind of distractions. So uh, maybe it's a good idea. I haven't thought of that before. No? <laughs> maybe we should encourage more climate change. I go back to the Stone Age faster. Okay. <laughs> You get interesting ideas when we give these talks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my point again is, it's simpler with the war, uh, yeah, is that actually, yes, the transition is difficult, uh, but there is, so there is an other end to this. There is an outcome. We're going somewhere. Uh, and then when you come to the other side of this, uh, of course, uh, we will be able to deal with it uh, yeah, one way or another. There will be a new reality, but you get used to things. Uh, what we are scared of is the change. Uh, yeah, the change seems scary. Uh, and of course it is partly scary, yeah, but guaranteed we will deal with it. Uh. So I apologize for, um, for <laughs> all those people who are working really hard on climate change and not kind of <laughs> minimizing the problem. I shouldn't minimize it because obviously it is going to be problematic. And please, we should of course do what we can, uh, but at the same time uh, we will be able to deal with it. Uh. Um, but um, we need to go beyond this as well. Uh. Um, how do I know what time it is, uh, Desmond? Is that, do I know that, or there's no, no particular clock in here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, that's very kind of you. Huh? So, uh, usually an hour, is that a good idea? So, uh, another 15 minutes or so. I haven't spoken for so yeah. long, I can't believe it. Keep it with you. Keep it, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, yeah. Thank you. But, uh, only for now, keep it only for now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a gift. Or, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, no, that's very, very, very kind of you. So, um, but, the, but this is only the beginning here. And the, because there is an even deeper understanding of this idea of climate change, of uh, the war in Ukraine, of the pandemic, uh, of all the refugees in the world, the various wars we have everywhere, the tsunamis that we have. Uh, sometimes you read about the asteroids. Uh, yeah, but the asteroids who kind of, kind of come and crash into Earth any time and obliterate all of humanity. Uh, you know, like they obliterated the dinosaurs. Uh, Millions of years ago. 
So all of these things, right, that can happen in the world there. And uh, so the point when we have a disaster like the war in Ukraine, uh, the point when we have a problem like the pandemic, yeah, the point when we have something like climate change, uh, there's actually a very important teaching in that, uh, and a teaching about the inherent uh, problematic uh, um, problem of the world in general. Uh, and this is what you saw when I was talking before about this fellow in uh, Norway who wrote this book after the Second World War. Uh, what he saw and what he realized was that actually uh, what we are developing uh, when there is an external enemy that we all kind of you know, work together against, uh, we're actually developing spiritual qualities together. Uh, we're developing compassion. Uh, we're developing kindness. Uh, we're developing a sense of working in harmony together, right? Uh, and even though the material world is far, far worse than before, we are more happy than before. Uh, what that means is that if you want to be happy, you better practice spiritual qualities and forget about the material things. That's obviously what it means, because you're more happy with less material things, but more spiritual qualities. And that, to me, is the real insight here. This is the profound thing to understand. First of all, to understand that the world is always going to be unreliable. The war in Ukraine is not kind of an aberration. Nothing has gone wrong in, in Ukraine. Yeah, everything has gone right in Ukraine. Yeah. yeah, because this is the nature of humanity. We go to war, right? Unfortunately, that's kind of what we do. And you're never going to be able to create the kind of utopian society where there's no war. Buddhism does not believe in utopians. Maybe there are some <coughs> strands of Buddhism that believe in utopians, but not the strand that I belong to does not believe in utopians. And the reason is because... Basically, things are impermanent, things are always changing. Yeah, it's impossible to have a stable system. Stable systems are undermined by the impermanence of the world. And part of that impermanence of the world is the defilements of human beings, the anger, the greed, the ill will, the delusion that we have, uh, which then uh, makes itself felt in all the social institutions we have, the political systems, weaves this way in, takes over power, yeah, like we see around the world. So utopias are not Buddhist. So utopian society are impossible, and if utopian society is impossible, we can expect wars, we can expect climate change, we can expect refugees, we can expect asteroids to come from the heavens and crash into the planet. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's true, man. <laughs> <laughs> Right? And so this is the point. And the point is nothing has really gone wrong because this is the nature of our world. And so this is an opportunity when we see the war in Ukraine. Instead of saying, oh no, something has gone wrong, oh no, something has gone right in the world. And what that means is that I have to shift my interest, I have to shift what I prioritize in my life, I have to move away a little bit from the worldly interest, trying to have a world that is going to be perfect, trying to live a life where I can just always enjoy myself in peace and happiness and all these kind of things, and move it away from that onto the spiritual path and develop the spiritual qualities within myself. Because that is where I have some degree of control. That is where I can actually do something. And this, of course, is precisely the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha, in the very famous Mahaparinibbana Sutta, have you all heard about the Mahaparinibbana Sutta? Yeah. yeah. Anyone who has not heard of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta? One. Okay. Only one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Okay. A few of you. Okay. Good. Thank you for being honest. That's actually very helpful. Man. So this is one of the most. A sutta is like a discourse by the Buddha, right? One of the Buddha's kind of teachings, if you like. Yeah. And this particular sutta is a sutta on the Buddha's passing away. Yeah. And it's a very powerful sutta. I, I would recommend it. There's one sutta you're going to read. Yeah read this one. Okay, how do you find it? I'll tell you how to find it. Log on to the internet. Mm -hmm. Go here. Yeah, everything is on the internet now, which is really good. Even the suttas. Buddhism was one of the latest religions to get their, uh, get our sacred suttas online, but finally we got there after some really hard work by some good friends of mine. But it, we are late, right? We are sometimes behind the times. That's kind of a that's kind of bad. But anyway, now they are available. So you go to a, a website called suttacentral.net. Yeah, and it has the suttas in all the original languages, Pali, Sanskrit, uh, ancient Chinese, Tibetan, all of those things, and it has translation into a large number of modern languages. Uh, so you can find it in Sinhala translation. Can you read Sinhala? Uh, you can. Great. So if you prefer Sinhala to English, you can read it. If you prefer English, you can read it in English. You want to read it in Norwegian? I'm Norwegian, right? Uh, I can read it in Norwegian. Uh. So whatever is your favorite language, you can go there. I don't think they have it in 
there's a few languages still missing, but uh, you know, like uh, yeah, whatever. Icelandic might not be there yet, but uh, you know, coming soon there. Uh, and uh, so, supercentral.net. Uh, when you log on, then you go to the discourse section, uh, and you go to the long discourses, and you go to Sutta number sixteen. Yeah, the, the Buddha's great passing away, and you read that, uh, and you may or may not enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> that really depends on you and kind of your. Uh, your attitude to these things. But it's a very, very beautiful sutta. It's about the last journey of the Buddha. And he walks, starts out in a place called Rajagaha, the ancient capital of the Magadha Empire. Yeah? Magadha Empire, this was the beginning of the great empire that was built up by Ashoka. Ashoka lived about 150 to 200 years after the Buddha. And that was when the Magadha Empire reached its largest state. India was at the largest uh, Cover the largest area it ever has in, in, at any point in history at that particular time. And he, of course, was the famous Buddhist emperor of India. But this started off in a very humble way in this tiny kingdom called Magadha, and uh, the capital was Rajagaha. I'm getting a bit sidetracked as usual. But, uh, uh, and so the Buddha starts out there, and it tells the journey of the Buddha walking from Rajagaha, walking through India, walking north. Uh, uh, via Patna, uh, today called Pataliputra in those days, and crossing the river Ganges and going north and via Vesali, one of the ancient large cities in India, and ending up in uh, Kusinara, or now called the Kushinagar or something like that. Uh, and that's where he eventually passed away. Uh. And so this is the last journey of the Buddha. Uh, and so this, and he knows uh, that he's coming very close to the end of his life. Uh, yeah? And because he knows that, he lays down all the things yeah, that are needed for the Sangha and the lay people to carry on after his death. So for that reason, it's an extraordinarily interesting collection of teachings about how to actually live. And it's incredibly relevant to us, because we are also after the Buddha, right? So he's speaking to us, basically. So when you read that and you think, wow, the Buddha is speaking to me, it's like your hair stands on end, you get goosebumps. Because you feel, this is the Buddha talking to me. This is not kind of just talking to those people, but actually to me, right here. And you start to shake a little bit, you quake. Oh, Buddha's talking to me. Okay, I better listen. Read carefully here. You read really carefully. Every word matters. Yeah? When the greatest spiritual master in human history speaks, it kind of really matters. And some of the things that he says in there, yeah, everyone knows the Buddha's coming to the end of his life. And Venerable Ananda, who was the Buddha's famous attended for so long, yeah. he loses his cool, if you like. <laughs> yeah, he becomes really distraught uh, because the Buddha is about to pass away. Yeah. And he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, I'm losing my sense of, I can't, the directions are not clear to me. Yeah? I can't remember the Dhamma anymore. Yeah? So he's getting really confused uh, because it, it's very hard for him to deal with the fact that the Buddha is about to pass away. Yeah? And this is Venerable Ananda, he's a stream actor, he's almost enlightened, yeah? and he finds this really, really tough. Yeah? And so then, in that connection, the Buddha sees that all, not just Venerable Ananda, but the whole of the Buddhist uh, establishment, yeah? and the non Buddhist non-establishment, uh, all the Buddhists uh, are affected by the same kind of grief. Yeah? What are we going to do now? How are we going to survive without the Buddha? Whenever we have the tiniest problem, we go to the Buddha to ask for a solution. Yeah. If you have tiny problems like, oh my Buddha, how long can I grow my hair before I have to shave it? <laughs> I feel so sorry for the Buddha, right? He has to answer all these kind of crazy questions that, that the monks have, but he does answer with great patience. And that's why we have this vineyard. This is actually one of my translations, the vineyard Pitaka, the, the uh, kind of monastic uh, rules and regulations. Uh, and that's kind of all that is kind of answered by the Buddha, yeah. And this kind of uh, one thousand two hundred pages of questions and answers, and the Buddha kind of lays down the law. There's some amazing stories in there. I would like to tell you some of those stories, but uh, <coughs> haven't got time today. So maybe next time, you have to invite me tell you some of those stories. <laughs> yes. So that people are really desperate, yeah? and uh, and the Buddha realized this, and then he says to Venerable Ananda, uh, he says, "Haven't I told you, Ananda?" And all the things that are dear and pleasing to you uh, must become otherwise, uh, must become separated from you. Uh. And Ananda says, yeah, yeah he doesn't, like, there's nothing, he, he's not quoted as saying that, but I guess he's, yeah, okay, you have a point, I suppose. Uh, I, I have no idea what he would think. Yeah. He probably said sadhu or something like that. And then uh, the Buddha says, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you, should, yeah, you should take, 
you know, understand people are taking refuge in the wrong thing. You know, they're taking refuge in the external world. They're taking refuge in the Buddha as a person. They're taking refuge in what is visible outside. Just like we take refuge in the world that is at peace, where there is no climate change, where there are no problems. We're taking refuge in the external world. And when you take refuge in the external world, that's when you have the problem. So he says to them, you should not take refuge in the external world. You should take refuge, you should be an island unto yourself. You should take the Dhamma as your refuge. Yeah. How do you do that? And what he says, the way to do that is there's twofold, two answers to that question. And one is the kind of discourse that we should go to and see as the word of the Buddha for the future. And that is very, very interesting in its own right. And he says it's the, what is called the 37 Bodhipakya Dhamma, the 37 aids to awakening. Basically, it comes down to the Noble Eightfold Path. For Noble Truth, this is what should be your teaching after I pass away. But then he says, even more profoundly, that your refuge should be the four satipatthanas, yeah, the four mindfulness meditations, the four establishings of mindfulness, the four applications of mindfulness, not the four foundations of mindfulness. That is a bad translation. I'll tell you why in a second. So that is your refuge. Why is that your refuge? Because this is like breath meditation, right? This is meditation where you go within. This is meditation where you let go of precisely the world outside and you experience peace, bliss and happiness within you. That is your real refuge because it, is, it has nothing to do with the world outside, nothing to do with the world of five senses. And there you can find all the peace, all the bliss that you ever wanted, in fact far more than you ever can in the external world in the first place. So the Buddha is actually saying, it's on the spiritual path. Yeah? He's, he's told us all along, of course there's going to be a war in Ukraine. Of course there's going to be climate change. And if you think it's not going to happen, well, that is where you have the problem. You're taking refuge in the wrong place. The refuge should be in the spiritual path. And of course, when he talks about the Satipatthanas or the mindfulness meditations as the spiritual refuge, that includes the entirety of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? It includes the right view, it includes the kindness and the morality, the right intention, the right effort, all of these kind of things, which are the gradual purification leading up to the Satipatthanas eventually, and then the mindfulness meditation. So this is the answer here. This is how you uh, withdraw from that world. You reflect on the world in the right way. You understand that the world is inherently unreliable. This is the message from the Buddha, even later on in the same sutta, the Mahaparibbana Sutta, the very last word of the Buddha, right? The very last word of the Buddha, Vaya Dhamma Sankara. Vaya Dhamma Sankara means conditioned thing, things, they're conditioned phenomena, or just phenomena, like, because all phenomena are conditioned. Phenomena are subject to uh, dissolution, or subject to being destroyed, or subject to ending. Yeah? Vaya means ending, it means like things come to an end. Everything in the world is subject to come to an end. So when you have peace, it is subject to coming to an end. When you have a, a climate stability, it is subject to come to an end. When you have no refugees, it is subject to coming to an end. When you have anything that is good, it is subject to coming to an end. And that can be despairing if you are too attached to those things in the world. But if you are not, and if you understand that this is the nature of the world, you change, you turn your mind in a different direction, you move it towards the spiritual practice, because that is the only place where you have some kind of, uh, of authorship, where you have some kind of ability to influence events within yourself. That is where you move instead. So this is uh, the idea, this is the right way of thinking about the problems in the world. If you use it for spiritual advancement, you use it for spiritual practice, and you turn your mind in a new direction. And if you use it in this way, it's going to be a tremendous blessing in your life, because it gives an opportunity to experience happinesses and peace and bliss and joy, and otherwise you may never actually have attained or achieved it. Yeah? Because, as I said before, we become complacent when the world is going too well. We forget that there are real problems, and because we become complacent, we become stupid. And we become silly, and we do, and we forget actually what the real nature of the world is. I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to stop there because uh, Desmond Cardi lent me his clock, which means I have to follow the schedule. So 
I'll, I'll pass it back to you if you like. Because, uh, uh, so uh, I will stop there, but maybe I can say a few more things in connection with the question and answer it. But I would like to give you the opportunity to uh, argue with me. <laughs> what argument down there? No, yeah. argument. Can yeah. you go on? You're yeah. saying that the translation was wrong to say uh, foundation of mindfulness. Yeah. Can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, you? absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, when, you, when you hear the translation of foundation of mindfulness, uh, it sounds like the meditation gives rise to mindfulness. Uh, yeah? If, if something is the foundation of mindfulness, it means that that is what gives rise to mindfulness. Uh. So the idea is that if you do Satipatthana, you get mindfulness from Satipatthana. That is what that translation suggests, right? But actually, that is a mistake, because according to, very clearly according to the Sutta, according to the Satipatthana Sutta itself, according to the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, yeah, it says you establish mindfulness first. Sati parimukkam upatapetva. Is your colleague any good here? Okay. <laughs> Sati, <laughs> mindfulness, parimukkam, kind of in front of you. Upatapetva, having established. Having established mindfulness in front of you, you breathe in. Mindful, you breathe in. Mindful, you breathe out. Satipatthana Sutta has a very interesting refrain in the beginning. It says that how you do Satipatthana, you do it uh, Satima, Atapi, Sampajano, Vinaya, Loka, Abhita, Domanasanga. Satima is one of the words there. Yeah. Satima means mindful. Yeah. So you do <coughs> Satipatthana practice being mindful. You have to establish it first. So mindfulness comes first. So that means that we're not doing the uh, Satipatthanas to establish mindfulness. Uh, we establish mindfulness first, then we use that mindfulness uh, to take the meditation further into samadhi. Uh, yeah, that is the point. Uh, and it's a very, very important point, because if, if mindfulness meditation is to establish mindfulness, well, th that, is, uh, kind of, uh, that kind of buys into this whole idea that mindfulness is kind of the be-all and end-all of the practice. Yeah? But in the suttas, it is very clear that the purpose of satipatthana, the purpose of mindfulness of breathing, is to take the mind to samadhi. Yeah? Samadhi is the final aspect of the noble eightfold path. Uh, and that doesn't really come out all that well if you could translate it as foundations of mindfulness. Uh, so I prefer the translation applications of mindfulness because you're applying mindfulness uh, to the object of meditation, which then would be the breath or whatever. Yeah. So these may seem like details, right? But sometimes they can actually be very, very important, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. People forget mindfulness is always present anyway. To some degree, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but I, I think that this is that this is true, yeah, because without mindfulness you can't do anything, yeah. Mm. But you want to make it so powerful that you have an awareness that is kind of continuous, right? Uh, and that you can actually use to because if you are really if you have very, very powerful mindfulness, uh, it enables you to regulate your life in great detail. Yeah, you, you never really say the wrong thing anymore. Uh, you don't even think the wrong thing because you catch yourself before that bad thought is about to arise. Okay, ill will coming. Okay, banish ill will. Yeah, just in time, you get it. And that's kind of the end. So mindfulness comes in a large number of degrees. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the mindfulness of Satipatthana, we talk about a fairly developed mindfulness at that particular point. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Ajahn. It was a lovely talk. Yeah, good. Yeah, in really peaceful world while you were talking. And I just, I just was... I was thinking a little bit about engaged Buddhism um, and how and when that should that should happen. Because I, I wonder if, if maybe as a, as a global community, as, as we might call it, we're a bit control freaky with the you know the sustainable development goals, millennium goals, etc. And if we want to choose an issue wisely to have a sort of drop in the drop in the ocean, how how we should do that. <laughs> I've not become a monk, I guess. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think, I mean, I think it's great to kind of, I, I have no problem with people being an activist, for example. You know, I think it's wonderful, it, but, but you have to be an activist in the right way. I think that is kind of the most important thing for me. Yeah? And I often hear people say to me that, you know, we are driven by ill will in my activism. Yeah, because when you have ill will, you have energy. Yeah, and without that energy, I can't do anything yet. Yeah? That's completely getting things really the wrong way. Yeah, you, ill will is a defilement. It distorts your outlook. You end up doing bad things if you have ill will. Do you really want to bring that into your activism? 
There's all the ways of developing energy. And the powerful energies of the mind really come through things like compassion and metta and kindness. You have incredibly powerful, actually far more energy and through those things if you practice those in the right way. And so it's great to be an activist, but do it in the right way. Do it out of compassion. Do it because you want to help the world. And if you do it in that way, you're actually building up heaps of good qualities within yourself. right? So it's all about balance. So you need to know, okay, what can I do? What, I, what is the most pressing problem? Where can, I, where can I make a difference? I think maybe, maybe that is also the uh, very important point. And where, what are my abilities? What can I actually do? Uh, and uh, then uh, find a balance whereby you don't exert yourself too much, uh, where you don't lose your own energy, uh, whereby you look after your kind of inner resources so you don't kind of go take it too far, yeah, and you become exhausted and all these kind of things. Uh, and so you find a balance in these things. Uh, but uh, the idea is to, uh, to uh, do good is always good, right? O obviously. Yeah. One of the other things on this topic, and I think is, uh, to me is very important, is that um, I think it's also often more powerful to do good to people who are close to you than people who are far away. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when we do something for someone who is an invisible person far away, like a climate change which may affect people, you know, in, in the Pacific, for example, people are really badly affected by climate change because basically the, the islands are disappearing. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes when we do things for people who are too far away, it becomes uh, more difficult to have that kind of immediate compassion. Yeah. Yeah, if you walk down the street uh, and you see a beggar, so well, so many beggars actually when I came down from Victoria Station, it's, it's terrible. Huh? It's painful to watch. Yeah, people sleeping on the street. Huh? Shouldn't really, shouldn't be necessary in our modern societies. We have enough resources to avoid these things. Huh? I was in the U.S. recently as well, and, and walking around in the big cities in the U.S. I was in New York, San Francisco, Chicago. You know, these kind of people everywhere. It's really terrible. And, uh, but when you then reach out to someone like that, maybe you offer them something, you give them something, sometimes you make a human connection that is far more powerful. Huh? And so you should be careful when we are, when we do uh, acts of generosity and kindness, uh, that we do it in such a way that it also has a powerful effect on you as a person, that you really feel that you are doing an act of kindness and generosity. Huh? And sometimes that can be very powerful when people are really close to us, right? When someone, someone you know, or maybe someone coming to the monastery, or suddenly you get this feeling of compassion, right, for somebody. And then you should really act. Because when that feeling is there, that act becomes very, very powerful. Huh? So when you feel the urge to do good, you should always do good. Huh? You, should never, you should never ask the question, oh, does, he really, does this person deserve it? Once you ask that, you blow the whole thing, right? If you feel the urge, give, for goodness sake. It doesn't matter if the person deserves it or not. Usually they do deserve it anyway. Yeah. So sometimes the closeness of the activity, I think, is important as well. I, I don't know if you've heard about this movement called, uh, I don't know, what was it called again now? Um, something about altruism. It was started by some of these ethical um, ethicists. I think... Uh, my mind is a bit blurry now. I've been traveling too much recently. <laughs> this came from, from Poland. A um, famous uh, ethicist uh, in the United States at Princeton University. He wrote Animal Liberation. He's an Australian philosopher. Uh, um, what was his name again? Uh, anyway, he, he is a leader in one of these movements that uh, would take the idea of altruism uh, uh, to its, what they consider its uh, final and obvious conclusion, right? Uh, that is kind of, you calculate how you can kind of make the most of your money, right? You have to put the money there, or can you have a spreadsheet and you kind of figure out how to maximize the benefit of your money. But it's very cold. And because it is so cold, I don't think it has the same kind of impact on you in terms of feeling good about things. So, yeah, a very important part of Buddhism is actually how it affects you. It should affect you in a very positive way. You should feel good about yourself when you live well. And if you make something into so, such a cold thing, it destroys that feeling of goodness that you have, or it can do that anyway. And I was also reminded when I was in Malaysia, because I, I travel way too much. And uh, <laughs> so I was in Malaysia, and they told me, well, you know, we talk about generosity and how to do, do generosity. And they said, well, here in Malaysia, what we do, we, we look at the various monks, and we see, oh, this monk has gone so and so far on the path, and this nun has gone so and so far, and this lay person is doing really well. And then we have like a spreadsheet, yeah, and we decide where we should give so much so that we maximize our merit, yeah. Well, Arahant gets so, so much, Anagami gets so, so much. And 
that also destroys the whole thing, right? It becomes cold. It becomes kind of, and that was obviously a caricature that was going on, but that was, you know, how they were thinking a little bit. So we shouldn't be greedy about merit, because if you are greedy about merit in that way, it destroys the whole warm, the human connection, and that human connection is so important in these kind of things. So you say something kind to somebody because you really want to say something kind to somebody, right? And then actually it's very beautiful. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being my colleague through all of these years. You have no idea. I've never told you before you've been my colleague for five years. You're a wonderful person. You've been sitting quite at a desk. Here's a cup of tea. Handshake. Wow, you're such a wonderful person. <laughs> Give them a hug if you feel like it, yeah? Something like that, right? And you kind of make a human connection with somebody in an entirely new way. Yeah? There's so many things we can do like that. Yeah? Anyway, thank you for being my colleagues, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> I, I have never said this before, but you are both wonderful colleagues. Yeah? I mean that, absolutely. Yeah. I, have to, I have to remember this now. All of us, I probably would never. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? You have to. Okay, anyway. Can I also say one on the subject that there are some leaflets about from outside on the table which you can pick up. Oh, this is the other cup of Yes. Is it? Okay, okay, great. Right. When you go yeah. out, yeah. when you leave, yeah. you'll find these little leaflets. So you can take one and read it properly. Very good for the movement. Good, then, yeah. It's one of the few Bikini monasteries in the UK, actually, so that's yeah, really great. It's the only one. Is it the only one? Yeah. Really? Is it? Is that yeah, the case? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Gee. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, you are really spearheading something here, really, like bulldozing the way. Is that right? Or is that the right word? I don't know the word. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Not bulldozing. Okay. Blue 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 blue. Okay. Okay. That sounds much better. Bulldozing. This has a wrong image. Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. Excellent. So, yes, I please, Madam. I have a yeah. sort of question, I guess. Yeah. And that's about um, complacency, which is quite interesting because I think it's quite easy sometimes if we have privileged monastic lives to become quite complacent and also to have too much distance from the world. So, what I find in starting this project is I have a lot more contact and it's actually very hard going to get the basic requisites just to survive. Right. Right? So firstly, I can see the point that material things don't actually equal happiness. But secondly, there's a big difference when we have the supportive conditions to practice compared to when we don't. So I guess my question is around like how not to become complacent and if we do have certain privileges and certain resources, um, how can we ensure that we still consider people who are in situations that don't? So sometimes that might be, for example, people on the mm. other side of the world. Mm. Mm. Um, and how do we keep our minds open to them? W w when you have enough? When we do yeah, have yeah, enough, okay, so you know, to stop right, that complacency yeah, 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 and yeah, 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 to sort of use our privilege yeah. in ways that benefit oh, right, people yeah. who really okay, don't yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, as monastic, I think the most, the most important kind of... Uh, not complacency is uh, to practice, mm -hmm. you know, practice the path properly. That's the most important thing here. Okay, so you can consider people at the other side of the world. Sure, you can do that as part of the path, of course. But uh, the most important thing is, you know, however you <coughs> practice the path, as long as you do it properly and wholeheartedly, that's the most important thing here. Yeah. And that is hard enough already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's very easy, as you say, in monastic life, to you know, to kind of things after a while, big things settle into a certain routine, and you follow that routine. Just like it can happen with lay people, it can happen with anyone, of course. Yeah. And the answer to that, uh, to not become complacent, is to get good Dhamma talks. Uh, yeah? That is always the answer. Uh, that's what it comes back to. Uh, because that is the foundation for everything in Buddhism. That's the foundation for faith. That's the foundation for Yoni Samana Sikara. It's the foundation for it. So you go back, and this is what I love about, you know, I have been uh, living with Ajahn Brahm for 30 years, uh, and I still, when I kind of sit down in the hall and listen to Ajahn Brahm, uh, I've heard it all before, you know. <laughs> because uh, it's impossible not to repeat yourself when you have been teaching for so long. Yeah. But there's something about the quality, uh, yeah, and that is what really matters far more than the content, uh, is the quality of how it comes out. Uh. And when I listen to Ram, I always want to practice afterwards, uh, every single time. Uh. So it is really, and so it's about this feeling a connection uh, with something profound and something deep. Uh, and that is what comes in Dhamma talk. That's what comes when you read the word of the Buddha with the right kind of attitude. Uh. So that is to me, that, that's the kind of the mainstay of this thing here. Yeah. And so uh, 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that exactly answers the question. It doesn't answer the question. I thought you looked a bit skeptical, so I thought you might <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I guess mm. it's just that some, sometimes I think monastics don't have enough contact with suffering, actually, to kind of really generate enough compassion to help. They don't have enough contact with suffering, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. it can get very comfortable. I mean, yeah. I'm actually not talking about my situation now, but I yeah. guess yeah. just to keep a perspective, you know, that we can speak from this place that, you know, it doesn't really matter if people don't have yeah. um, material needs, but that's easy to say when we have them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, okay, maybe you're right, then. but I think I have the feeling personal that if I get a good Dhamma talk, then mm. I not tend to do the right thing, yeah. I hope so, anyway. <laughs> That's right. kind of how I see. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I agree. Yeah. It's you know, good to kind of uh, to reach out. I, I mean, one of the things about the monastic as well, you know, as a monastic, you are, you can just go up in the forest and meditate on yourself. You know, you know it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the Buddha left his family life and he just went off into the forest to meditate. Uh, and he created something that was really, really worthwhile. If he hadn't done that, he wouldn't, wouldn't have what we have. Uh. And so it is, it's a kind of bigger picture thing as well, right? Uh, there's many, many aspects to this. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I'm not, sure, it's, it's, I'm not sure exactly where yeah, you're coming from, but I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it's enough. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so who's first then? Uh? Yeah, okay, you're first. Okay, good. Me? <laughs> yeah, please. So it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, something yeah. similar to what Venerable Chanda asked. Yeah. Uh, but in, in the lay person's perspective. Mm -hmm. So here we are in a developed country, as you say, mm -hmm. and you know everything is there, and we are quite comfortable, and then uh, we can go complacent, and um, yeah. we are not in a war situation, so and, uh, you know, how, do we, how do we create those qualities that you have? You said that the Second World War people had and the Ukrainian people had. Yeah. When we are living here, yeah. when everything is fine. Well, you, you, you remember that the, the war in Ukraine is not an aberration. It can happen here in London. Yeah? Maybe not exactly the same way, but things can happen here. Maybe something else happens here. Maybe, maybe the climate change breaches the Thames barrier or something like that. And kind of the water kind of floods in or, or whatever. But things can happen here as well, in one way or another. Uh, and so you, uh, you just use kind of this, uh, these problems in the world as, as a reminder that uh, actually this is true everywhere. Uh, this is not something which is true in kind of certain isolated uh, areas or whatever. Uh, but in the end it's about, uh, in the end it is about the idea of death. Yeah? The death really kind of puts a very clear kind of um, uh, perspective uh, on what life is all about. Yeah? Because death is like almost kind of brings all of these things together. Uh, because death is like the biggest kind of change that we have. It kind of brings climate change and war and everything into one point because we have to give up so much. Yeah, with war we have to give up a few things. With climate change we have to give up a number of things. But with death we have to give up almost everything. And so you, the reminder of death is actually very, very powerful. And one of the symbols that I wanted to say, is one of my favorites, one of my symbols in the suit that I really like, is the symbol of the borrowed goods. Yeah, which I kind of teach very, very regularly. And this is the idea that, that uh, everything we have in life, uh, yeah, almost not everything, but almost everything we have in life is borrowed. Uh, yeah, we have it for a while and then it has to go. Uh, and the Buddha has a similarly of this man who kind of has this carriage, yeah, has a carriage and is wearing golden jewelry. Uh, yeah, so obviously he's a kind of wealthy man, uh, but he has borrowed all of these things. He has borrowed the carriage and borrowed the jewelry. Uh, and then he kind of rides around in this carriage in the city, and he was like, wow, look, the wealthy, this is how the wealthy kind of enjoy themselves. So then he becomes proud, yeah, I'm wealthy, I'm important, or whatever, you know, you know what it's like. And, and uh, then, of course, he has to give it back again, yeah. And then when people take back all of those things, because now you have identified with these things, uh, you have become, these have become, you have become, instead of you owning them, they own you, as they say, as the saying goes, right? Uh, and you have become kind of this, you have become that person. Uh, and in the same way, in our lives, we become all of these identities. Uh, yeah, we become a person in a certain relationship, we become wealthy, we become educated, uh, or we have relationships with other people, our identity is tied up with that, our identity is tied up with all our possessions. Uh, we have attachment to these things. Uh, but uh, the problem is that they are borrowed goods. Uh, we have them only for a short time. Uh, 
It all has to go. And it's kind of this is kind of so obvious, but true, right? Everything you own in the world has to go, and all the relationships, all the people in your life have to go. So much of your status and identity, your gender, your education, all of these kind of things, it all only has meaning in the context of this life. Once you leave this life, it doesn't have any meaning anymore. No. Your body has to go. Don't spend too much time in the gym. Yeah, it <coughs> has to go anyway. It's a waste of time. Spend just enough to be healthy, not to kind of to, uh, to look your best or whatever. And, and so, uh, yeah, it all has to go. And we don't know when it has to go. It could be very soon, right? There is no time to waste to holding on to these kind of things. And so then you realize, well, what is the one thing that does not have to go? What is the one thing that we actually do own? The Buddha says we are the owner of our... Karma. karma, exactly. What is that karma? That karma is of all the goodness that you build up inside of you, right? When you do good actions, you feel good about yourself. Karma is not some kind of miracle thing that suddenly you die and you become happy. Karma is what you build up right now, build up good qualities inside, build up a wholesome mind. You take that mind with you into the future. That is really kind of the root meaning of karma. So you start to see, well, how should I invest in my life? What should I really invest in there? Should I invest in all these borrowed goods? If you rent a house for three months, how much money are you going to put into that house? The beneficiary is going to be the owner, not you, right? So there's a, very, there's a limit to how much money you're going to put into it. You put a little bit because you are a decent person, so you do the right thing. But, you know, if you rent a car, are you going to really look after that car? Probably not. You're going to look after it, but you're not going to add enormous amounts of value to it. And it's the same thing with things in our life, yeah? We, okay, these things are important. Uh, we look after the people around us, uh, but we also understand very clearly that these are all borrowed relationships. Uh, things we own are borrowed goods. Uh, put the effort into being kind. Uh, it makes the relationships better anyway, right? It has a double positive effect anyway. Uh, be kind, uh, be caring, be compassionate. Uh, understand that we all have this suffering together. We have, this is what we share in the world. Uh, yeah, and as you live like that, you're actually building up the one thing yeah, that you will be able to take with you into the future. Yeah. So simple things like that. Yeah, I mean, this symbol is actually incredibly powerful. Yeah. And you know, in the suttas, this particular symbol is only like two lines long. Yeah, yeah. and that's why it's so important when you read the suttas, when you read the word "stop," what is he trying to say here? What does this mean? Yeah. That symbol you could talk about it for one hour because it's so so beautiful. Yeah. What is actually what is the word trying to say here? Yeah? And then as you kind of get the message, it starts to sink in. Okay, I need to remember this life is a very, very uncertain. What, so what does that mean? Well, it means I have to live well. Now. So these are some of the reflections you can do, right? And this kind of broadens out the idea. So now we have broadened it out from all the problems in the world and kind of taken the final big problem, which is death itself, which kind of summarizes everything into one, really, I would say, anyway. That's my way I see it. Yeah. Anyway, yes, please. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, explore that concept of death from the Buddhist perspective. Yeah. And that if we are a dependent originated phenomena, and this, a dependent originated phenomena yeah. Yeah. in this life, right. and we're going to be reborn into another life yeah. where it'll be different aggregates, a different body, yeah. why is there an urgency, as, as the Buddha says, to break that cycle? Because that, that relationship between me now. And whatever is formed in the next life, yeah. it's, as, it's the same relationship between anyone here. If you feel compassion for the suffering that they feel yeah. in the next life, but it isn't me. Does, does that make sense? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand the question, but it's, it's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, that's what I meant by it doesn't make sense. I didn't think that. The question is clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is your accent come from? Scottish. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's really cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Um, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense because uh, it is like it's the same thing actually right here in this life. Yeah, if you look at yourself today compared to what you were ten years ago, uh, you are really a different person. Uh. So does that mean that uh, ten years ago you should not care about what you are today? Should you do things ten years ago that would make your life miserable today? Uh? No, obviously not, right? Because there is a sense of continuity there. Yeah, you are neither complete. You are in one way completely different, but in another way there's also continuity. Uh. And it's exactly the same thing across lifetimes. Uh, yeah? So you may even be reborn in a place where you can remember you being a human being before. Uh, 
And you will see that as you, just like you see yourself 10 years ago as you, you will see that as you in that previous life. Yeah? So there is a continuity in a much deeper sense than you think. And that's why when you recall your past lives, uh, actually you see it as you in those past lives. Uh, it is not just some random person. It's not like you know me or, or someone else here. Yeah? It actually is, feels like you. You were there. Uh, and this is kind of the horrifying experience of remembering past life. It's actually very scary. Yeah? We're seeing this kind of thing going on, yeah, rolling on without any kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of endless thing, no idea. Suddenly you understand how trapped you are in that samsaric existence. So. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. You happy with that? Yeah. yeah? Okay, good. Yeah. You're very welcome not to be happy, so please let me know, because <laughs> I, we can you know, have, a, have a discussion about things. So, so please, yeah. And what would you say to someone who actually doesn't believe in next life? Yeah, I would right. say. <laughs> I would say. I would say. Well, uh, uh, think about it very carefully. Yeah. Don't reject it too quickly. Yeah. That's what I would say because uh, it has incredibly powerful consequences if there is another, if there is rebirth. Uh, I think we sometimes underestimate the consequences of this. Uh, the Buddha recalled his past lives before his awakening, yeah. and I think he would not have achieved awakening without recalling his past life. Because recalling the past life was what made the clear the suffering of existence. Without remembering that, he wouldn't really be practicing, he wouldn't be a Buddhist, right? What's the point of being a Buddhist? Okay, you, you die in this life anyway, everything comes to an end, okay, it's no big deal, so everything is okay. Yeah. It is precisely the idea of rebirth, which is the problem on the Buddhist path, uh, the thing that things carry on. Yes, Buddhist practice has an effect on this life, and that is also very important, uh, but the real goal of Buddhism. Uh, is to end this suffering, large-scale perspective suffering here. So I would say to someone who says they don't believe it, be really careful. Reflect very, very carefully before you reject these things. The Buddha, the greatest spiritual genius in human history, said there is rebirth. But that is a really good reason for believing in it. If you go to school and your teacher tells you what plus one is two, do you believe or don't you believe? You you usually believe, right? Or the, or the teacher says, take something a bit more, less obvious, that uh, Napoleon lost the uh, you know, fight at Waterloo or something like that. Okay, so you believe it. You don't know whether Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo, but you take that on board because that's what the history book says. Why would anyone want to deceive you about those things? Yeah, so you accept that. Yeah. But these teachers in school, they are just uh, minnows. They are nobody compared to the Buddha. The Buddha said there is rebirth. Who cares if a teacher in school said that Napoleon lost that Waterloo? The fact that the Buddha said there is rebirth, that's far, far more significant. If the Buddha said that, surely I should take that seriously. Just because he lived in India two and a half thousand years ago doesn't make him a completely different kind of teacher from the ordinary teacher in school. No, he's still the same kind of teacher. That distance in time and culture is actually quite irrelevant. He's still a teacher in very much the same way. Huh? If he said there's a rebirth, but okay, if you are a Buddhist or you are leaning towards Buddhism, uh, you have to take it seriously because the Buddha said so. Huh? That is my argument. Uh. Yeah, maybe I should um, uh, make the question a little bit more specific. <laughs> please, actually, please, please. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. For Buddhists, it's easy to uh, approach yeah. that in, you know, in the way you, you were describing yeah. earlier. But um, if for like the majority of, of uh, say, Westerners mm. um, who actually don't believe in afterlife, mm. then how do you um, okay. help them approach that? Oh, okay, okay. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I would say that actually there's a lot of people in the West who believe in an afterlife and believe in reincarnation. It's actually much more than you would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People who are Christians, people who are, there are people who are atheists uh, who believe in rebirth, right? Uh, so even atheists believe that because it doesn't really require a belief in a creator God to believe in rebirth. It's just a natural cycle of things. Uh, and so this is the first thing. Actually, there's quite a lot of people who have that intuition that there's something called rebirth. Uh, uh, the, the problem has been that we have lived through a time in history uh, where the idea of materialism, of physicalism, uh, has been in the ascendancy. Uh, yeah? And everyone has said that, well, the mind is just a product of the physical body. Uh, this has been kind of the kind of general kind of cultural idea that we have had. Uh, but uh, from what I can tell, things are changing. Uh, yeah? And we are now moving away from that a little bit. If you look at the history, I am no expert at all on philosophy, but I know that in 
the history of Western philosophy, there have been times uh, when the other ideas have been very strong, like what they call idealism, the mind, for example, being primary. And uh, we are now, it seems to me, moving again there, moving towards making the mind more important in our culture. Uh, it's happening partly in physics, it's happening in neuroscience, uh, yeah? it's happening in various areas. Uh, and even philosophers are saying there's no way we can explain how mind arises from matter. It's completely inexplicable. We have to change the entire paradigm. We call it paradigm shift. So we change from one worldview to another worldview, this kind of stuff. And I think something is happening in our culture. And I think that we are, I think we're, going to, we're moving more towards making the mind very central again to our worldview and our outlook. And that will allow new ideas such as rebirth to be taken seriously in an entirely new way. Because that idea really only makes sense if the mind is a core aspect of how we view the world and how we kind of, it's a core element, if you like, in the world. So I think things are changing. But you're still right, though, that there are many people who don't have that idea. So how do you, how do you kind of deal with them at the time of death? I would say you deal with them in the same way as everyone else. Yeah, okay, if someone dies and they're an atheist, they think they're going to disappear. You help them have a good death still, yeah? You, you uh, talk to them like you would a Buddhist. You remind them of all their, what they have meant for you, their good qualities, yeah? And you, this is kind of one of the beautiful things to do when someone is dying. Yeah, yeah? tell them, yeah, I've never told you this thing before, but you know, these are all the things I value in you. Yeah, and, this, and so people, and that often goes to the heart of people when you tell them what you value in them. I tried to do that with my own father when he died. He died about three years ago now. And I wrote him a long letter before he died and he passed away. I had never really told him exactly what I, you know, how I appreciated him. And so I wrote him a long letter saying, well, went into great detail right, about the things I appreciated about him. And I could tell, by the way, when I spoke to him next time on the phone, I could tell that it had touched him. Yeah? Because there's something very powerful about that, when you actually really go into detail and you explain those qualities that you appreciate in another person. So when someone is dying, you can do that, whether they are a Buddhist or an atheist or whatever, and then they can die with a peaceful heart. And then when they find out there is rebirth after all, they will go to a good place afterwards. <laughs> anyway, so that's my, that's my answer to you. So... All right, are we running out of time, uh, Desmond, or uh, no? Well, there, there is some tea downstairs, if any, and yeah. some, some biscuits and so on. Yeah. Um, can I thank you for a wonderful mm -hmm. talk? Yeah. You, you cleared up a thing about the foundations of mindfulness, so I've always wondered about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you. Okay, good. Then. Thank you yeah. very much, and yeah. thank you all for coming. It's delightful evening, wonderful for us all to be together and share this night. And thank you so much for making it possible. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs>